So thank you for being here. We're actually, um, we've just moved to this building and we're renovating our main meeting room, which is upstairs, which is going to seat maybe 100 at the end of the day. And this is our going to be our library. And we also have this collection of, and I should say, we're the Center for Migration Studies of New York. And my name is Don Kerwin. I direct uh, CMS. But we also have a, a, an archives that goes here in this room and then in the back room, which is kind of a unique resource of um, documents, collections from the 19th and early 20th century on earlier waves of migrants that came through Ellis Island. So we have a lot of the documents of the various resettlement agencies and um, the records of the U.S. Bishops' Conference from the early 1900s. Um, so we're going to do more and more with our archives, and um, this is a place where scholars come and do research and look at the archives. Let me take a moment to explain what we're doing here today. Um, over the last year, with support from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, we have been convening a group of some of the nation's leading experts on refugee and immigration issues. Um, and we, we talk about uh, this project as a refugee protection project, but what we mean is the formal refugee resettlement program in the United States, the political asylum program, temporary protection programs, and other programs that are involved with protecting vulnerable people. As a group, you know, our goal has been to think about how we can collectively strengthen the U.S. Refugee Protection Program. And, um, of course, protection of those, you know, fleeing for their lives or seeking freedom is kind of a core part of the U.S. identity and culture. Um, but at the same time, we recognize the need to create kind of a secure refugee system, a secure political asylum system. So a lot of our thinking has also been about dealing with um, the transnational criminals, the threats, the terrorist threats, so that we can have a very robust refugee protection system. A number of us have agreed as, a, as part of these conversations to write on particular aspects of these issues. Um, and so there's going to be a series of papers coming out, including the first two, which will be today, on tempor U.S. temporary protection programs. And those are written by myself and Claire Bergeron, who is uh, with the Migration Policy Institute in Georgetown University. Um, and all of the papers are going to be published in our new public policy journal called the Journal on Migration and Human Security which is a free online journal, and if you don't get it, you should get it, um, and just let Rachel or myself know, and we can sign you up for it. We're also going to, when the papers are more or less done, do a, do a longer event, likely in June, likely in early June, with a number of the authors, and then we're going to follow that up with Hill briefings and various other rollout events. So please stay tuned for that, and I, I hope you'll look forward to that. But we decided before that to take advantage of Margaret Stock's presence in New York this week um, to begin this conversation now. And Margaret has been working on this issue of territorial access, or thinking about this issue of territorial access, and I know she's been doing that for an awful long time. And the basic thought being that can people who are fleeing for their lives or who are in need of protection actually reach territory where they can gain protection? And um, this is a, a very pressing need, given a lot of the security-related measures that have been enacted and are being enacted, and, and frankly, just immigration <coughs> control measures as well. Other people are writing on issues like the U.S. political asylum system, you know, the political asylum case law, the issue of statelessness in the United States, unaccompanied children, a um, particular look at the refugee resettlement program itself, due process issues, Mark Nefari, Nefari is here, who's writing on those, a Mexican political asylum issues, which are a, a major issue now on the U.S.-Mexico border, but increasingly throughout the country, the, um, Haitian, the treatment of Haitian refugees in the United States, and other issues. Let me, let me say that I have... Um, I've known and admired Margaret for a number of years, and I think that she's the perfect person to be with us today and to, 
to write and to talk about these issues. When I directed the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, uh, this was probably a dozen years ago now, we invited Margaret to speak at one of our <coughs> annual gatherings, and we were asking her to speak on the intersection between national security and immigration policy at that time. And she was a, this was the first time I'd actually heard her speak, and she was a real, a real hit, a terrific hit. She's <coughs> smart, she's trenchant, she was appropriately serious, but she was also extremely irreverent. And I, the thing I remember most from that presentation was her, um, was her expressing fear about protecting America from the threat of Cat Stevens and people like him. And for the younger people in the audience, Cat Stevens was a 1970s balladeer and um, singer who wrote such scary songs as Peace Train and Morning is Broken and, and songs like that. Margaret also has been very, very active with the American Bar Association, the Commission on Migration and the Section on International Law. Um, over the last several years, she's assumed a lead role nationally in making the case against federal and state legislation that sought to eliminate birthright citizenship um, for the children of unauthorized parents. And she's really been a fear fearless advocate on that issue. She's testified before congressional committees. She's debated at major ABA events. She's debated before the Federalist Society and in many other fora as well. And in her spare time, and this may be what Margaret is most known for, she created the Military Accession Vital to the National Interest Program. And the acronym there is the MAVNI program, or the MAVNI program. And what that program does is it allows legally present residents who have necessary language um, and medical skills to join the military and to apply for citizenship on a fast track. And I'm not sure exactly kind of the status of that program now, but Margaret can speak to that as well. She was, I should say that she's a, she was a colonel, and she's a retired colonel in the U.S. military. And she was a member of the, um, the counterterrorism um, center at West Point for many years. The, um, the MAVNI program has benefited thousands of immigrants, and I think it's also enhanced U.S. security. And really nobody but Margaret, who has been the immigration attorney for the Pentagon and the, the really de facto immigration attorney for thousands of military families could have created, conceptualized, and implemented such a program. Margaret is also on the editorial board of our Journal on Migration and Human Security, which we're happy about. And I should also say, which many of you may know, that Margaret became a MacArthur Fellow last year, which is commonly called the MacArthur Genius Award. So. She, that, they confirmed what we knew for a long time, is that she's a first-rate mind and a, and a, and a first-rate advocate. So we're very pleased to have her here today to dialogue with us. Thank you. And, sh and um, she got, apparently, Cabby drove her around and around, so we're, we're we are happy that she's here. We're hour trying to find the building. I finally got out of the cab and said I would walk. It was obvious we were heading up to Central Park again. <laughs> Anyway, thank you for the really nice introduction. I, I think I now have to change my remarks to address all the things that you, that you um, said I should address, so I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, it, it's hard to, to be humorous when you're talking about territorial access to asylum, so I'll get that piece out of the way by telling you I am from Alaska, and Alaska is a famous state. It's the only state that's ever had an unauthorized immigrant as its governor. Uh, it was not Sarah Palin. It was... Uh, <laughs> Sure. Um, Alaska is the only state that's ever had an unauthorized immigrant as its governor, as far as I know. And it was not Sarah Palin. It was an individual <laughs> named John Franklin Strong, who was the territorial governor of Alaska in the early 1900s. He was appointed by the folks in Washington, D.C. who didn't check his papers before they made him the territorial governor of Alaska. And he was outed when his other wife showed up from Canada looking for him because he had two wives also. He said there were difficulties with getting access to divorce courts back then. So um, he hadn't managed to get a divorce from the first wife before he married the second one. And, um, yeah, this created a, quite a scandal in Alaska, and he was run out of town, um, back to Canada. Uh, but this did not start uh, a series of paperwork checks on future governors. They kind of left that for a long time until September 11th, when things started happening in terms of paperwork checking. Um, I, I did retire from the Army as a lieutenant colonel, not a colonel. Yeah, lieutenant colonel. 
eternal light. Um, and you asked about the current status of the MAVNI program, so I'm happy to report that the MAVNI program is quite alive and well. They have um, upped the quota. Originally it was 1,000 people a year, and now it's 1,500, but it looks like it's moving up. They're going to add another 900 or so. Uh, and it's been very successful in recruiting uh, large numbers of highly qualified people. One of the most recent people, for example, who joined the Army under the MAVNI program a few months ago was a MIT uh, PhD candidate in nuclear engineering uh, who has two master's degrees from MIT and he got a leave of absence from his PhD program to join the Army. Uh, the Army made him a chemical, biological, and radiation specialist, which is a pretty low ranking job, but he does obviously have expertise in that area since he's studied nuclear issues at MIT. Uh, and he's now a U.S. citizen. So hopefully the Army will see the light and send him back to finish up his PhD, and then he can teach people in the Army about those issues. So Don had asked me to talk with you today about the issue of territorial access to asylum. And I think the starting point there is a good quote from Namai Robinson in 1953. It said, he said, quote, if a refugee has succeeded in eluding the frontier guards, he is safe. If he has not, it is his hard luck. That's the end of the quote. And I think that, that sums it up pretty well, This the state of things. Uh, most of you in the room know that if you want to apply for asylum in the United States, you have to get here. Uh, now, I know there's a myth out there amongst the public that somehow you can run up to embassies overseas and you can demand asylum and somehow the embassy will open its gates and grant you asylum. Uh, in fact, that's not really true. Um, there are some isolated cases of famous people getting granted asylum at embassies, but generally the embassies have lots of guards outside to keep people from doing things like that. Uh, so you can't get in to apply for asylum, even if you wanted to, but the, the default rules you have to get here. And of course, we, our starting point is with the United Nations rules and the UN Declaration on Territorial Asylum, 1967, Article 3. Um, the legal duties only generally arise when a person reaches the state's territory, so a state doesn't have an obligation to go out and grant asylum to people outside its territory. There is, of course, the Article 33 prohibition on expulsion, non-refoulement provision. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has interpreted that, saying that there, it has no extraterritorial effect. Uh, so states are not required to let large groups of refugees into their territory either. So this creates a very large issue with access because um, we have this principle on the one hand that we're supposed to be granting asylum in the United States to people who have a well-founded fear of persecution on account of their race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. But on the other hand, the state has many, many concerns that argue against letting people get here. Uh, migration control, of course, being the, the super big one. And the rationales you'll hear generally fall into kind of three categories today. You hear people saying, well, gosh, you know, we can't um, have access to our asylum procedures because they're used for illegal migration. And that is a valid concern. I mean, people uh, point to that frequently, and I as a private attorney in private practice have experienced that, but it's not quite as stark as the states pointed out to be. And I, I think it, it bears mentioning that Part of the problem today is that our overall legal immigration system in the United States is broken and dysfunctional. And as a result of that, people who want to get here for legitimate reasons look for any means necessary to get here for their legitimate reasons. So for example, if they want to be reunited with their family member and it's going to take 25 years for them to, to be on a waiting list to be reunited with their family member, they may attempt to use the asylum process to get here earlier or faster, even where the claim might not be considered the strongest claim. And so the asylum system feels pressure from the larger, broken, legal immigration system, and that causes people to try to take advantage of the system or to you know, use the system, not necessarily in a bad way, but because they can't use another system that, that's close to them that would probably be more appropriate. Uh, and in my private practice, I've seen people who would make great small business owners but were frustrated by the, there's no legal process to do that, try to make out an asylum claim. In order to get to the United States, what, where they really want to do is run a small business, uh, but they do have a legitimate asylum claim, so they make that. Um, or people who are here on visitor's visas but find no alternative to some other perfectly morally acceptable end, um, filing for asylum because they have a claim and that's the only way that they can get uh, a green card or access to, 
permanent residents in the United States. So there's, there's a larger picture here, but today I'm going to try to focus a little bit more on what exactly is going on. Um, so the states say that they need to prevent illegal migration and prevent the use of asylum applications for backdoor migration. That's usually what you hear, backdoor migration is the term. Uh, then they also say that there's this problem, if it's easy to get here and file for asylum, then lots of people will try to get here, and they will engage in dangerous journeys to get here. And so if we make the asylum system tougher and make it harder for people to get here, then they won't um, engage in these dangerous journeys. And you often hear the justification for the lack of territorial access couched in human rights terms that we want to stop people from making these dangerous journeys to the United States that uh, would then allow them to apply for asylum. And then, of course, we hear the national security rationale. And since 9-11, that has been uh, forefront. You know, people point to the blind sheik and, you know, other people who... American authorities feel have misused the political asylum system and then harmed America or used the system openly in order to get here so that they could harm the United States. So the three main rationales are that there's backdoor migration going on, there are dangerous journeys being undertaken, and there's national security considerations. And for that reason, we need to control carefully access to the United States for the purpose of having people apply for asylum. Of course, at the same time that those rationales are in tension with the desire to provide protection to people who deserve it. And so that creates a fundamental disconnect in the system where we're constantly fighting between this desire to give protection to the deserving and the desire to uh, enforce the rules against those perceived not to be deserving. As a practical matter, uh, most asylum seekers in the world can't get to the United States, so they can't claim asylum here. The territorial access issue is a function of geography. Uh, two big oceans, um, Canada to the north and Mexico to the south, do have, have some impact on blocking people's access. I'll talk a little bit more about how much of an impact. Um, I, I mentioned coming from Alaska. It's, it's extremely hard for people to get into Alaska. Uh, except by air, you know, uh, once in a while we've had some uh, freighters that have come through, you know, and people in uh, shipping containers and so forth coming across the Pacific and freighters and that sort of thing, but it's, it's, it's pretty hard for people to get uh, to places like that on their own uh, without paperwork of some sort. So there's this emphasis right now on preventing people from getting to the United States, and to go back a little bit more to the larger picture, a lot of my work post 9-11 has been on the issue of um, what does it mean, what does national security mean when it comes to immigration? And the traditional viewpoint that's been expressed after September 11th, 2001 was that it was all about keeping people out of the United States. And I tried to turn the discussion around a little bit and say, no, it's not really about keeping people out, it's about letting the right people in. Uh, and we need to be thinking about how to make our nation stronger by letting the right people in. Asylum plays into that because, of course, if you are going to just turn everybody away because you're afraid of everybody, then you're not going to let in the people who deserve protection. And the fact of the matter is that many of the people who deserve protection have strong, will make strong contributions to the United States in the future. Um, I just uh, read uh, very briefly, someone sent it to me this morning, an obituary from um, in, that was in the newspaper today about it. Uh, an individual who had come to the United States as a refugee and ended up working for our government and playing a key role um, in the United States, ended up working for the CIA, as a matter of fact, um, in a very key role. Uh, and he had earned his citizenship through military service, but, you know, had started off his life as a refugee. And I point to people like that as an example of, you know, why the asylum system doesn't just benefit America from a moral standing. We feel good because we gave somebody protection. But we also end up many times with people who have a potential to contribute to our larger society and contribute to our national security and contribute to our global um, participation because they have knowledge of countries in which there is a great deal of conflict and they can bring that knowledge to the United States and put it to good work, often working for the government or for the military. But back to uh, the issue of territorial access. Okay. The United States has actually become very good at making sure people can't get here. Um, to claim asylum. And that has been kind of a strong, very strong theme of the post-9-11 environment. Um, there are many ways to stop people from getting here. Uh, and I would say probably we're the world leader in, in making sure that people can't get here. Um, there are 
<laughs> two main categories um, of ways we stop people from getting here to claim asylum. First is external deterrence, the big category of that, and the other one is internal deterrence, I would call it. And I, I credit James Hathaway and Alexander Nave for uh, coming up with these terms, but they also call them non-entree practices, making sure somebody can't just can't get here. And the first one, of course, is our visa system. Uh, we have a system where you can't generally come to the United States at all legally unless you're overseas and you get a visa of some sort to come here, with a few exceptions. And we quite actively deny visitors' visas and student visas to refugee-producing countries. Uh, if you tell a consular officer when you're applying for a visa that you plan to apply for political asylum, unless you have Schindler as your consular officer, you are not going to be granted your visitor visa. Now I have heard in recent months of consular officers actually giving people visitor visas because they think they're going to apply for asylum, but they don't put that in any of the paperwork and they don't tell them that. Um, I ran into somebody from Ukraine recently who apparently was given a visitor visa by a consular officer who actively knew this person was going to be applying for asylum. So that does happen, but generally speaking, if you tell a consular officer that you're planning to apply for asylum in the United States, you will just be summarily denied any kind of visa, visitor visa or student visa. Uh, we do have some special programs, I should point out, for certain people who would be classified as refugees where they're specifically permitted to get visas. I've worked a lot on the special immigrant visas for Iraqis and Afghans, um, but those are imperfect visa systems and they only, they only work for people who worked for the United States overseas, essentially. Uh, also, we have an interesting variant on them now where we're denying those visas because we think the people would be better off in Iraq or Afghanistan helping to rebuild Afghanistan or Iraq for our purposes. Or in other words, um, the United States is concerned that the people who worked for them are probably in danger if they don't come to the United States, but it would be better for U.S. foreign policy if they stayed in Iraq or Afghanistan because then they would be sort of forced to help rebuild their society. And then, since they work for the United States, they have a pro-U.S. perspective, it's thought. So we have a little bit of a trend going where officials have openly admitted that they don't want to give these visas to people who are qualified for them because then they'll you know, undermine the rebuilding efforts that are going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so our first line of defense against getting people to the United States to apply for asylum is the visa system. It works pretty well. For people who aren't, um, aren't required to get visas, we, we've had a major, major source of asylum applications coming from people who get on airplanes on the visa waiver program, which is the program where you can just get on an airplane with your passport if you're from one of countries that's eligible for the visa waiver program. And if you get here, of course, you can apply for asylum. And the United States realized that this was going on quite a long time ago. And so they started the Advanced Passenger Information System, and they started ESTA, and there's now an active program to check to make sure that people's passports haven't been stolen. Um, this was uh, highlighted recently with the Malaysian Air airplane that was missing when it came to light right after the, the plane went missing, that two, at least two individuals on the plane were traveling on European passports and had the intent to apply for asylum. Now, they probably couldn't get to the United States on the passports that they were using because the U.S. does check for stolen passports. We're one of the countries that does check the system to make sure people's passports haven't been stolen. Uh, so it would have been pretty hard for those individuals to get to the United States to claim asylum. But it was pretty clear that they were trying to get to Europe and that their, their plan was, after they interviewed the family, that they were using these stolen passports to get to Europe so that they could claim territorial access to asylum in Europe. Um, in the past, that was possible to do, and the United States had a lot of um, problems with European passports being stolen or altered or used. Um, Italy was a, a real source of uh, Italian passports were constantly being used by people who weren't from Italy, but who would get on a plane and fly to JFK airport and then claim asylum either at the airport or afterwards. So the U.S. has uh, ramped that system up to try to stop that sort of thing from happening. And preventing people from getting on a plane in a foreign country is a good way to stop them from gaining access to asylum. We've also started uh, pre-inspection processes overseas in certain places where uh, officers who are responsible for checking your immigration paperwork will check it before you get on the airplane overseas. And that reduces the number of people who can get to the United States. Of course, we have penalties on airlines for not checking people's papers correctly. Uh, the airlines are not supposed to check whether somebody's got an asylum claim or so forth, but they are tasked with just checking their paperwork before they get on the plane, and they can be fined heavily 
um, if uh, people get on the plane that weren't supposed to be on and claim asylum when they get to the airport in the United States. Uh, we've also come up with ideas for preventing people from getting to Canada or Mexico, uh, because if people can't get to Canada or Mexico, then they can't walk up to the border with the United States and claim asylum. And this has been something that a lot of people have done, um, and it's pretty well known that if you can't get a visa to go to the United States and you're very, very desperate, what you should do is somehow go to Mexico or go to Canada and then walk up to the border. And post 9-11, we were having quite a few people, in fact, I think you were on the trip down to the border that I made with a, a large group of people. We were talking to Mexican government officials, and they said that, yes, they have lots of people flying into Mexico who walk up to Mexican government officials and say, you know, I really don't want to be in Mexico. I want to be in the United States. I want to claim asylum in the United States. Please show me where the border is. And the Mexican government officials would escort them up to the border and present them to the U.S. immigration officials and say this person wants to apply for asylum. Uh, many of these people were from Middle Eastern countries. Uh, for example, Iraqis who couldn't get a, an Iraqi visa to come to the United States and they would somehow get to Mexico. And um, it was interesting because they were totally upfront about what they were doing. You know, it was because the U.S. was denying them a special visa to come because they feared um, persecution or they couldn't get refugee status. So they were actively going to Mexico, walking up to the border and applying for asylum. And this led to some fairly outrageous statements that terrorists were trying to claim asylum at the border. Most of them were not terrorists. Um, a lot of them were Chaldean Christians or other people who had worked for the United States. But because of this, there's now been an increased emphasis on trying to get Canada and Mexico to screen people um, and prevent people from going to those countries who might be trying to claim asylum in the United States. And then, of course, we have our infamous, long-standing interdiction at sea um, efforts. These are primarily aimed at folks from uh, Caribbean countries, particularly places like Haiti, where we actively have the Coast Guard and, and other vessels out there um, looking for people who might be trying to come to the United States to claim asylum. Um, the post-9-11 executive order in 2002 basically saying interdiction was okay. Uh, we've had it's worth mentioning we've had a variant of practices over time in terms of ocean interdictions. Um, everything from no screening, you know, if they find you on the water, they don't screen you at all for a well-founded fear of persecution, they just send you back, to uh, onboard screening of people that have been picked up to check whether their refugee claims are valid. And we've also had offshore determinations over the years where uh, the United States will ship people to a certain place and then have them screened at that place. Uh, Guantanamo Bay was somewhat famous for that, but we've done it in other places like Guam, uh, where we've taken people that we think are potential refugees and shipped them to some island that the U.S. has control over, and then we've done refugee screening there. Uh, we've also had interdiction on land, um, programs to find people before they get to the United States and turn them away. Uh, and then um, we can turn to what is kind of a hybrid between external and internal. We have a summary removal process at the border, which is quite famous. And Don and others have written about this, our expedited removal process, which is supposed to allow people to make an asylum claim. And it's gotten better over the years, I would say. Uh, but the idea is if you show up at the United States border and your papers are no good, then you're expeditiously removed. You don't get a full hearing with the judge. You basically get turned away almost immediately. And there is supposed to be a process within that expedited removal process for uh, the officer to check whether you have a well-founded fear of persecution, whether you're afraid to go back home. Initially, when expedited removal was implemented, there were many, many complaints that legitimate refugees were being turned away. But because of the criticism, that more and better procedures have been put into place. And it looks like it's not as bad as it used to be. At least that's the conclusion most people are coming up with. Um, for how that program is working now. And then finally, the last category of things I would, I would stick in the category of external deterrence. We have um, safe third country agreements or other burden shifting um, arrangements. And the idea here is that we, we're not going to let people, uh, we're going to prevent people from coming here and claiming asylum by putting the burden on somebody else to process their asylum claim. So if they get to Canada first, well, then the Canadians have to deal with them sort of thing, uh, making it legally harder for people to apply for asylum. 
So that's kind of a rundown of the numbers of ways we externally deter people. And now I'll talk about the internal deterrence. We have this idea that if we make it harder for people who get here to claim asylum, then even though they get territorial access to asylum, they won't claim it because it's too hard. And within that category, we have the expanded use of detention, uh, detention at the border or at the entry point, and then um, detention, you know, they're here in the United States, but there may be some reason why we can detain them. Uh, they came in on the visa waiver program, perhaps, or something. Um, some people have charged, although I'm not sure that charge is valid, that we have harsh conditions in our detention centers to try to deter people. Now, it may not be an intentional deterrent, but as a practical matter, that does deter asylum claims. And I know this as an attorney because I've had a number of clients who have said to me, I can't take it anymore you know, in this detention center. I can't stand the conditions in this detention center anymore. And so I'd like to give up my asylum claim, even though I have a valid one because I just can't take being in, in locked up in detention anymore. Uh, one of the more prominent and famous examples of this almost happening is in the extremely good book, Do They Hear You When You Cry? It's about a woman from Africa who's claiming asylum in the United States on the basis of female genital mutilation. And she was in a detention center for a very long time. And the book openly talks about how many times she talked to her lawyer about, I just want to give up. I'm, I can't stand being in a detention center anymore, so just let me out. Uh, of course, that story had a happy ending where she was eventually granted asylum and was released from the detention center. We also have the one-year filing deadline. Uh, we have limits on work permission and public assistance uh, and so forth. And all of these are intended to officially to stop fraudulent asylum claims, but they also operate to prevent legitimate asylum claims because people feel that they just can't take it anymore, so to speak. Uh, the U.S. today has not yet adopted some of the more popular European methods for limiting territorial access. And I'll just mention uh, two of them that are well known, the special asylum seeker housing that um, some countries have adopted where if you apply for asylum, you end up in a special housing type of unit, uh, or restrictions on movement. Um, if you're in the United States and you're not in detention, you are not restricted from moving if you're an asylum seeker. So you're not told you have to stay in South Florida or you have to stay in Jersey or, you know, whatever, Alaska. Um, I have heard proposals that they would stick people out on one of our remote islands in Alaska, but that hasn't come to anything yet. So, All right, so that's kind of a rundown on... Uh, the methods and means that people use to uh, try to, or the, country, the United States has tried to use to limit territorial access to asylum. And, and as a matter of fact, they have been pretty effective. You know, given the numbers of refugees around the world, the numbers of people who would like to seek political asylum in the United States, the United States has not seen overwhelming numbers of people, with the exceptions of a few um, incidents that are interesting historically but don't happen every day, such as a large influx of folks coming from Cuba or Haiti in response to some external event. Uh, there are some interesting proposals out there that I just thought I'd mention briefly um, to alleviate some of the problems people identify from a lack of access to asylum. Um, James Hathaway and Alexander Neve, who have um, I mentioned earlier, have an idea out there for collectivized responsibility proposals where countries as a group would take uh, responsibility for trying to deal with these problems rather than dealing with individually where everybody sort of deters everybody and you get the least common denominator ruling. Um, there's a interesting market-based Peter Shuck proposal kicking around which kind of reminds me of the Kyoto carbon trading protocol idea uh, and he's basically arguing that different countries should have a certain number of refugees that they should be responsible for, but they can like pay other countries to, you know, kind of take care of them. So that's why I kind of say it's sort of like the Kyoto Protocol. Um, you can trade carbon credits and you can trade refugee credits. I'm not quite sure what I think about this idea yet, but it sounds like you but are. it's out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, um, as David Martin has pointed out, the basic problem with all these um, deterrent measures and restrictive practices are that they're indiscriminate in their impact. And so the, the nub of the problem here, and the one that I think is the deserving of the most discussion, is how do you become more discriminate? How do you figure out who these legitimate refugees are and figure out a way that is going to allow those folks to have access territorially to the asylum process, and yet at the same time, 
um, keep the people out that you don't consider to be legitimate, such as the person with a marginal asylum claim who's on a 25-year waiting list in the family um, fourth preference category, and that's why they're claiming asylum, that um, they, if they could get here faster with their family preference petition, they would do so. Um, what we have currently and post 9-11 has really been um, kind of a downward spiral towards the lowest common denominator where we're, we really are focusing on limiting access and not focusing on granting more and more access. And of course there are, you know, reasons, legitimate reasons why asylum applications increase. And it's not going to be the case logically that we would always have exactly the same number of people seeking asylum every year. Um, asylum applications vary in number depending on whether there's a war or conflict going on. Uh, they, they vary depending on the failure of other systems. And I would be willing to place a bet on it, Don, that if our legal immigration system got fixed, we would probably see a, a significant drop in the number of people trying to seek access to our asylum system. And that's something that often people pay no attention to in the asylum community. You know? But I think it, I, it, I would be willing to bet that that would be the case, that if we fixed our currently broken legal immigration system, we would see dramatic in, reduction in the number of people seeking asylum. Um, the other interesting factor that plays into this that we don't really have control over, but it, it causes asylum applications to increase is, is the economy. And of course, we know that that is not one of the five protected grounds, you know, that you, you're not, you can't make a living in your home country, so you're not eligible to seek political asylum. We refer to people who are seeking asylum on the basis of economic distress to be um, economic refugees, and it's sort of derogatory, you know, that you're coming to another country because you can't make money in your own country. You know, there's something wrong with you somehow. Um, in fact, our ancestors in America mostly were coming to the United States for that reason, in large part. You know, they thought that America was a place where they would make a better living, and, and yet today in the world we consider that to be a derogatory reason for seeking asylum, and you, or not a legitimate reason for seeking asylum, that you have some kind of economic distress. But it is a fact that asylum applications increase when the economy is bad. Uh, which tells you a little bit about what I was saying earlier about the, you know, the broken system. People look at the asylum system and they seek territorial access to it in the United States uh, for reasons other than the typical five grounds that we think of in the statute. So we have little or no control over those things, and, and yet we seem to have this perception that there should be sort of some target number of asylees that should be allowed in the United States every year, and it's a, it's a number that nobody will exactly name, but you know, it's not dependent on whether there's a war or conflict or um, it's just dependent on the idea that we should only have a small number. Um, this was distressingly expressed in my town, Anchorage, Alaska, a few days ago by a school board candidate who said that uh, he was upset at the number of refugees in Anchorage and that he thought this was negatively impacting the school system and one of his uh, agenda items he was running for school board was to reduce the number of people we were, quote, importing, you know, who had all these problems, quote, unquote. And you can go check out his statement. It was rather stark, but he was comparing his high school experience when his high school in Anchorage many, many years ago, he's 75 years old, so he said when he was in high school it was 98% white. And he implied that now that it is only 46% white, there is a problem <coughs> and he pointed to the refugees as being the problem. Uh, we went and checked the numbers and it turned out there were 38 students who were refugees placed in the Anchorage school system last year. So it was a very tiny number of people, but somehow this person in the community who was running for the school board had gotten the idea that our school system was being overwhelmed by people. And that plays into this idea that we shouldn't have too many refugees. And of course, there is a legitimate concern that if you had millions of people suddenly migrating to the United States as refugees, that would overwhelm our systems and overwhelm our society and it would be a problem. But so far, uh, we have not really seen refugees in such large numbers attempting to apply for asylum that they really uh, disrupt our social networks, except in a few localized incidents like, you know, the Cuban and the Haitian cases that I mentioned earlier. So there is supposedly this limit that we want to place on people out there, but nobody will say exactly what the number is. And I think there's um, probably more work to be done by scholars in studying, you know, how many people the United States could actually absorb. And uh, we've been good at absorbing them in the past. We've done quite well with that. 
Th those arguments, however, date back well before the entire refugee protocols were set up. Uh, if you study American history, you'll know that when Jewish refugees were trying to come to the United States prior to World War II, there was limitation limitations were placed on them just purely because people said the numbers, you know, there'd be too many people coming. And that's an argument that you also heard again in the uh, FGM debate, that, you know, if we let women get you know, asylum based on female genital mutilation, then half of Africa will show up here. Um, well, that didn't happen. You know, the United States gave that protection to people. Uh, through the court system, when the courts finally ruled that FGM was a valid basis for asylum, and the United States has not been overwhelmed with half of Africa showing up here and claiming asylum. But that is in large part getting back to this idea because people just can't. You know, people would, probably more people would apply for asylum if they could achieve territorial access to asylum. So I will stop there because I know I've kind of run over, and uh, we, will, we can go ahead and do a little discussing. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I always learn a lot when I hear when I hear Margaret talk. I, I wanted to um, maybe open it up, and we'll do we'll do we'll have a lot of dialogue here. This is how these things work. So we always have very well informed um, audiences. But let me start with a couple of um, observations and questions. I mean, the first the first is I was reading a UNHCR report the other day, and. Oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> and it went through this. It went through this, you know, familiar and depressing litany of detention, um, abuse, verbal abuse of migrants, occasionally um, physical abuse of migrants, deportation, a surge in unaccompanied minors, interception programs, you know, on and on. And I thought to myself, well, that that all sounds familiar, you know. But actually, what they were talking about was the. Um, uh, the treatment of Syrian refugees in Egypt, you know, which which goes to, I, I guess, my question for you, or one question, which is the extent to which these practices uh, in one country, the United States, will relate to or influence practices in other countries and vice versa, whether for good or bad. And I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, because you have kind of an international group here. We have State Department people, and we have um, people kind of work in the UN system. I think we have a UNHCR person here as well. So if you could speak to that, uh, because the Syrian refugee crisis is very much on everybody's mind right now. Sure. Well, uh, you know, I think everybody watches what everybody else does, and people watch what they think are effective practices by one country, and they tend to try to adopt those things. So certainly uh, people are now talking in the wake of the Malaysian aircraft incident that, gosh, everybody should be checking you know, everyone's stolen passport list. And it turns out some countries are not, are letting people on planes who are carrying passports that have been stolen and that, that shouldn't be happening. Um, and of course, at the crux of that is there were two guys trying to claim asylum. You know, we want to stop that is basically what people are saying. Um, I have seen and I've heard European officials say that they watch what the United States does and they try to, you know, if what the United States is doing looks like it's working, they'll do something similar. But at the same time, I'm not sure the U.S., as doing what a lot of other countries are doing for, you know, whatever reason we aren't doing the special housing. Uh, we aren't limiting movement within the United States yet, although there is a proposal I've heard for Detroit. Oh, really? Yeah, where they may uh, allow people to apply for asylum in Detroit, but you can't leave Detroit. It hasn't been written about yet. What do you think of that idea? Yeah. New Yorkers may have an opinion um, on that. The Detroit model, right. It, it might actually improve economic conditions in Detroit, because I think they get a lot of highly motivated people who would run a lot of small businesses and, and do quite well. So um, it's an interesting idea. Um, yeah, I think countries do watch each other, and they and they um, delegations go and visit other countries and watch what they're doing on the border, and they try to figure out what's working and what's not working. And some of the proposals in the United States have come up because the United States went and talked to Canadians and they went and talked to Mexicans and they said, how come all these people are walking up to the border? You know, what can we do to stop this kind of thing? Let's coordinate something. And we end up with things like you can't get on a plane to fly to Canada if you're passing through U.S. airspace unless the U.S. has cleared your name and said it's okay for you to fly over U.S. airspace. And that gives the U.S. a chance to check, you know, in its own systems whether somebody should be allowed to go to Canada because they might then try to show up in the United States. And initially, this is couched as a security measure. You know, we're trying to make sure that person who we know is a terrorist is not getting on a plane and going to Canada 
because then they might attack the United States via Canada, but it also prevents people from applying for asylum, because if they can't get to Canada or Mexico, then they can't walk up to the border. So it also uh, has that second and third order effect. Thanks. The, so on that issue of coordination, um, the, um, the coordination seems to take place on enforcement, but I'm wondering if it takes place on protection burden sharing too, and that, you know, kind of to think about to think about the Syrian crisis for just a second. We we now have nine million people who are displaced. You know, 2.5 million of them um, registered refugees, or 2.6 million, um, and about six and a half internally displaced. And you have a, a million of them in Lebanon. So you have one refugee for every four Lebanese right now. And um, and the Syrians, I don't, I don't think there's been a big uptick in political asylum claims in the United States because of this territorial access thing. So the Anchorage school system has its 38 refugee kids and is feeling burdened. But Lebanon, you know, has, has you know, 20% 20, 20 or whatever it is of its population is now refugees. And same thing in other, other countries, other, other surrounding countries. So, you know, the question is, are there... Are there good models in terms of burden sharing? I think, you know, the United States has contributed, I think, something like $1.3 billion to that crisis, to, to programs, which is great, to programs for the, for the refugees right now. And I'm sure that it's um, starting to, or will soon start in 2014 to resettle some refugees. I think UNHCR is um, talking about 30,000 refugees that might be resettled in 2014, referring 30,000, the U.S. will take some of those. And if refugee processing goes like it has in the past, it's in, given the size of this crisis, it's quite likely that they'll be resettling a lot more refugees over many, many years into the future. But the general question is, it seems to me that there's really decent kind of sharing of enforcement um, and coordination of enforcement but maybe not such good coordination on refugee protection issues, you know, and I, and I wonder if you, if you might respond to that. Well, I think you're right if you say if there's no coordination going on in terms of, you know, the, the G7 don't meet and say there's X number of refugees in the world, let's split them up, you know, and everybody will agree to take X number because, you know, it's a collective responsibility. I, you know, it would be great if we would have a system that worked like that. I think it would probably help a lot, uh, but we don't. Uh, it's definitely something that might be worth looking into in the future. Where, where I do see coordination, unfortunately, is on um, making the laws tougher for granting refugee or, or uh, granting asylum applications. For example, the U.S. often looks to the Canadians and what are the Canadians doing? And oh, they're granting too many applications under their law. Um, you know, what's the Canadian law on something? And they'll sort of pressure the Canadians to say, "You guys should be tougher because you're, you know, you're making us look bad by." granting all these claims, you know, based on uh, whatever under your law, and we don't grant them, and um, that creates a problem. Uh, so I see more of that going on, but not a whole lot of what you suggest, which I think would be a really positive development. Yeah. And I, I mean, I know that there are forums to do that, and I know there is some level of coordination, so um, between, and this is the migration development, but it's also kind of the humanitarian side of U.S. refugee response, and uh, in the, in the refugee side. Um, the, this, this issue of detention, I wanted to raise it too, as being a disincentive to protection. What, what we found in, as part of this process is that um, it's very directly being used at the U.S.-Mexico border. For example, we have attorneys that are involved in this that represent a lot of asylum seekers down there. And what they're saying is people come to the, come to the border crossings and the ports of entry and they ask for asylum and they're told, yeah, you know, we'll consider that claim, of course, but, you know, you're going to be in detention for a period of time here. It could be, a, you know, a lengthy process. And so the people are in this position then to decide, okay, do I actually kind of come over, go into a detention center, or do I try to, do I try to make a go of it here in, in, a, in a dangerous border city, you know, where I'm fearful? So, I mean, that we're, I, th I think we are seeing that. And uh, on this issue of... Um, the David Martin I'm, I'm curious about is that kind of parallel 
the, the price of rights type of argument where the basic idea is that the more rights you provide people, the less number of people are actually going to be admitted to a country. You know, is he making that kind of an argument for refugees as well? In other words, we need a tighter refugee standard in order to get greater public support or in order to actually open up the, uh, you know, the, the, the gates for a more generous policy. I wonder if you could talk about that a bit. Well, uh, I'm not sure he's... There's a little bit of that. It's kind of like the arguments people make that you have to check people who want apply for public assistance more carefully because, you know, we want to make sure the public assistance only goes to the truly deserving and not to the people with yachts and, you know, that were in the news the other day that they're, you know, pretty wealthy people but they're getting food stamps and free medical care from the U.S. government. You know, I think that's more what he's trying to say, that you need to set up mechanisms that don't just treat everybody the same but that somehow distinguish between the really desperate people and the people that, you know, gosh, I don't want to be on a 25-year waiting list, but, you know, I do have a claim to asylum, but it's probably not, it's not frivolous, but it's, you know, I, I could probably survive somehow, but I just don't see that as an option, you know, staying in my country for X number of years, and the legal system isn't working. And you, you mentioned Mexico, I mean, that, that really is turning into a big flashpoint. In fact, one, um, there's an ex-border patrol agent who goes around the country now arguing that everybody in Mexico should be applying for asylum. Um, and he thinks this would be a good way to pressure the United States to fix a lot of the problems on the border because he thinks the system would be overwhelmed and that would be a good thing um, from his perspective to get attention to the problem. And, um, of course, if you're a practicing attorney, you have seen an uptick in Mexican asylum claims. A lot more of them are being granted. But at the same time, you know, you, the United States government insists that they can't give political asylum to everyone in Mexico. And everyone in Mexico can get territorial access were it not for detention. So, you know, that definitely there are issues there. Yeah. So let's, um, let's take comments and questions. We, we, we like to do that and spend a lot of time on that at these events. So... Rachel, I don't know if you want the microphone to go to people, or what's your... Uh, should we repeat the questions? How do you yeah, want to do that? Repeat the questions because it's wired. Okay. So, questions or comments? Yes. And if you could identify yourself, yes. too. Um, my name is Barnett, and I am um, a PhD candidate, and I'm studying Liberian refugees. Okay. And I wanted to ask you about the Liberian identify yourself as a total victim, you have to play to particular gender stereotypes. And I find that problematic um, when you talk about that these are the people who really are deserving, because that means that you have to see yourself as a very much a victim. And these people are not victims because they're survivors. Um, but this is what I'm hearing. We want to make sure these, these people who deserve um, protection, they get them. Okay, but so, yep. So the so the question is um, for somebody who works a, a, with Liberian refugees and others, this notion of um, deserving refugees does that turn refugees more into victims and re and require them to play a role that's stereotypical and um, and and not accurate? Well, yeah, and I think you're you're pointing to one of the big problems with this whole system. Um, you're not allowed to apply for asylum unless you fit into one of the five categories. And if you can't articulate to an asylum officer how you fit into one of those categories, you just don't get asylum. No matter how wonderful you are, no matter how legitimate your concerns, no matter how much you've survived, um, it's it's one of the aspects of the regime that we've set up. You know, there's only five grounds for being granted asylum in the United States. And if you can't fit in the box, you're out of luck. You know, and, and it probably isn't fair at some under fundamental human level. It's just the regime that we've decided on and the one that everybody signed on to. So that's why people denigrate economic refugees. Uh, I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time pointing that out, but I certainly feel, you know, if I, as a human being, if you can't make a living and you're starving in your country, you know, it makes perfect sense that you're going to get up and go move somewhere else and try to come to some place where you can get food and you can work and you can support your family. That's just a natural human instinct and nothing to be uh, criticized, 
And yet, if you show up at the border of the United States and say, I'm starving in Liberia, and I want to make a living, and I can you know, get a job here, I could, there's lots of things you guys need to have a worker shortage, and I could do plenty of things, you know, they will just turn you away summarily and detain you and kick you out of the United States because you're not fitting into one of the, the five boxes that we've set out in our law for qualifying people for asylum. So I think you're pointing out something that absolutely is true. I, I wonder, as somebody that represents a lot of asylum seekers, though, do you think that the whole process is about um, lifting up people's victimization, or, or, or can people come forward and really um, be, be what they are, which is survivors, people that have overcome territorial access issues and all sorts of issues in their home countries as well? Well, again, you, you, a lot of it's going to depend on how you... Many times when people are asserting an asylum claim, they have an advocate, a social worker, a lawyer, you know, somebody trying to help them. And you have to train the people who are helping them in that perspective. Because there's sort of, there's a tension there. You know, they're trying to help their client get asylum. In order to help their client get asylum, they have to put the client in at least one of the boxes, preferably all five if you can do that. And they have to convince an asylum officer that this person is deserving of asylum. So there's definitely going to be a tension there between being upbeat and positive and trying to show that this person is a survivor uh, and yet at the same time convincing the asylum officer this person is deserving. You know, if the asylum officer is an educated person who understands different socioeconomic factors, you know, maybe they would understand that somebody who is coming from that perspective should still be granted asylum, but another asylum officer might say, gosh, you know, you don't really need asylum. You know, you don't have a well-founded fear of persecution. Um, so there is going to be a tension there, and I think it's going to be a difficult one to resolve. If you're interested in these issues, by the way, I definitely encourage you to read a book, which I'm in the middle of, and I love it. Um, Lives in the Balance, Asylum Adjudication by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, comes from some close friends of ours who, who have written it. Uh, and this just came out in New York University Press. It's quite good, and it, it points up the randomness of the asylum adjudication process in the United States. Um, the asylum approval rates vary dramatically from one part of the country to the other. They vary by whether you're a woman or a man. You know, a woman has a much higher rate, grant rate. If you're, women have much higher grant rates than men. You know, what is the logic of that? I think that plays into what you're talking about. And I hope if you're doing a thesis, that you work on issues like that because it could be very exciting. Okay. <laughs> Other comments, questions? Yes. Um, my name is Jan Paul Brecke. I'm a Norwegian researcher working in Oslo and uh, mostly on Europe, the coordination of European asylum uh, system and European asylum policy and practices. I uh, have three short comments. The first is, on, I would like to hear your views on the resettlement program as a burden-sharing mechanism. The <coughs> uh, UN, uh, you know, the UN resettlement program compared to the asylum system. Um, and then, and secondly, I think that I just want to comment that the Syrian situation is very challenging for Europe, obviously, and it's interesting to compare it to the situation in Bosnia in the mid 1990s and the responses and challenges to the system. <coughs> system of course is more coordinated now uh, but but still has uh, I, I would say a very tame response um, uh, whereas uh, single <coughs> countries like Sweden and Germany have taken uh, initiatives and have a completely different response from the system as totality my third my third comment would be um, you were looking for a coordinating a coordination between countries um, with regard to also the positive humanitarian side of, of their asylum uh, system. And I think that Europe is a good example in that with all its faults, uh, the process over the last 15 years have been one of enormous progress. Coordination between the countries in the common U European asylum system has gone much further than anyone had predicted in the early 90s. So, uh, and that goes for for uh, securing individual rights in all <coughs> steps of the process, the processing, the status, all these directives, now 10 to 12 directives that all the countries have agreed on, putting like a, a minimum standard 
and most countries are above that. And we have not seen what everyone feared on the, let's say, on the NGO side, that uh, the kind of, that would lead to to a race to the bottom, to this mid, you know, towards the minimum standards. Uh, in, on country, on the contrary, has pulled pulled the worst countries up, speaking those terms, whereas the better countries have not kind of fallen for the temptation to kind of lower the standards. Thanks. So, so three-part comment on kind of coordination and burden sharing. The first is the issue of the refugee resettlement as a burden sharing mechanism or program. The um, the second being the um, the comparison between the the massive challenge that's created by the Syrian refugee crisis and compare it to that to, to the response to the Bosnian crisis in the 1990s. And then the third the um, the success of European states in coordinating um, asylum and humanitarian responses over the last 15 years. Okay, I didn't understand. I think you were just commenting on those, right? Not asking questions. The so, resettlement program would be right. great. Yeah. Yeah. Very common. Well, I did want to talk. I think that's a good point. Um, the U.S. refugee resettlement program is very distinct from the asylum program. And there are, um, one of the obvious distinctions is there's a quota for the number of refugees that the United States resettles, and, the, and that's set by the executive branch every year, and it can vary, but, you know, it's, there's a certain number of people, there's no quota for asylum. And so the populations are extremely different, because if you are coming as a refugee, generally speaking, you've been processed overseas by a refugee group, there's NGOs involved, the UN is involved, and so forth, and there's, you know, you've been identified overseas as being worthy of protection. Um, the asylum is the people who managed to get here to the United States, and it's a very, very different population. Um, in fact, a lot of the asylum applicants are people who never would have been granted refugee status overseas at all. Um, they wouldn't qualify, they're not in a part of the world. Um, the one that was in the news recently, the German homeschoolers, you know, um, I don't know if people have heard about this, but the U.S. an asylum application was filed by a German family that was homeschooling their children, and they felt they would be persecuted if they went back to Germany with their kids because the German government wasn't going to let them homeschool their kids, and they were granted asylum in the United States. And the case was overturned on appeal, um, and they lost their asylum grant. But then the U.S. government um, gave them deferred action, so the whole family is now going to be allowed to stay in the United States. And, you know, they were positing what they felt to be a legitimate claim to persecution on account of their views of educating their children. Uh, folks like that would never be considered a refugee resettlement. It's just a completely different, um, you know, population. And that's an extreme example. But what I see with asylum applicants are generally they're the people who were motivated to get here somehow. So it's a different population from the folks who are identified overseas as refugees. Now, there are some overlap. Um, one of the things we saw with the problems with the Iraqi and Afghan special immigrant visa system was that when the U.S. cranked up uh, enforcement, I guess, on a national, they were worried that terrorists were going to sneak into the United States, having been given green cards through the special immigrant visa application process. They stopped issuing visas to people for national security reasons. What people did was they tried to become refugees, and they succeeded in doing that. They would go overseas and sign up to be a refugee and then come into the United States as refugees. Or they would walk up to the border with Mexico and apply for asylum, or even Canada. So we had um, educated Iraqis who couldn't get a visa because they had worked for the United States government. They were eligible for one, but the U.S. wouldn't give it to them for whatever reason. And they would get a visa to go to Canada on a student visa and then walk up to the United States and claim asylum. But it's a, a very different population, typically, from the folks that end up in the in refugee resettlement programs. Not always, but very different, usually. One, uh, one, one thing that the Syrian crisis kind of raises for me, too, is whether there's a geographic component to, to the burden sharing. And when I was thinking about temporary protection programs in the United States, um, you know, our own State Department has made six protracted refugee crises a, um, a priority, a full diplomatic, humanitarian development priority for the United States. And, but none of those countries are countries that produce large numbers of migrants to the United States or large numbers of, frankly, long-term, temporary protected groups, you know. So you don't, you don't have uh, Haiti in there, you don't have um, 
Mexico, you don't have you don't have Guatemala, Salvador, some of the places that are producing unaccompanied minors. And is there would it make sense? I'm not. A, I'm obviously totally supportive of the State Department addressing protracted refugee crises um, all over the world, and I think that's extraordinarily important work. But would it make sense to to focus on the um, on the nations that are actually sending migrants to a particular country like the United States? Oh, sure, that would absolutely make sense, but it might not make sense politically. I think you know. Um, I mean, Mexico is a great example. We don't have a refugee program at all, and you know, we don't um, we discourage asylum applications from Mexico, even though that's a significant amount of people that are coming to the United States, and they they're right there, you know, right on the border. And we know we know the communities that produce them too. That's we the do. thing. I mean, it's they're not like us, a, right. You know. So the particular communities. Yeah. Other comments? Other questions? I feel like we've been talking about the State Department. Would you like to say anything? I don't. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but we're actually there's one. There was one comment you made a moment ago, uh, suggesting that SIV applicants who were unable to get through the security screening process would then turn to the refugee missions program. I just want to emphasize that the U.S. Refugee Missions Program security screening process is essentially identical to the security screening process for SIV applicants. There may be other reasons why an SIV applicant who is rejected would turn to the refugee program. Perhaps the nature of their service to the SIV program wasn't sufficient. Um, but the implication that uh, a person would turn to the refugee admissions program because they couldn't get through the intensive security screening for SIVs is, is just not accurate. They'll go through the very same security screen. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's a very good point. Sure. Okay, the question was, or the comment was, that the screening for the SIV program is the same as the screening for the refugee program. Essentially, essentially the same, so that a person could not get through the refugee program if they got through the SIV program. I think that's absolutely correct, and um, it might not have always been the case, though. Um, and also, the perception out there. Uh, among the individuals involved was that you might be able to come through the refugee program even though you couldn't get through the SIV for whatever. It might not have been for security reasons, though. That's right. And I'll give you an example, um, and this is a case I handled um, just just to um, throw out a real-world example. Uh, I know of a woman who was working for the United States in Iraq and applied for the SIV program. Now, she wasn't denied on security grounds, but was having a great deal of trouble getting through the system as a logistical matter because the system is somewhat confusing and has been confusing. Um, interestingly, she was also married to an American soldier who had snuck her onto a military base to have the wedding on the U.S. military base. Um, so she was working for the U.S. as a translator, then she married an American soldier who um, snuck her onto the base in violation of security rules. Okay, to get married to her, which created problems with her SIV application. Uh, and then this American soldier got her pregnant and abused her. And it turned out that he was still married to someone else back home also, so it was um, a bigamous marriage. Uh, she didn't know any of this. She applied for protection under the Violence Against Women Act, which allowed for legitimate protection for somebody in this kind of situation. This is a U.S. law that allows women who are married to Americans who are abusive. It covers overseas abuse if the employee, the person that's abusing you is an employee of the U.S. government, which this Army soldier was. So we were successful in getting Homeland Security to approve a VAWA application for the woman, but that had to be processed overseas. In, in fact, it had to be processed at the time in Damascus. So she shows up in Damascus with her visa having been approved, and the officer, State Department officer, who hadn't been trained very well on VAWA, said that she wasn't eligible for her VAWA visa because the marriage was bigamous. And in fact, there's an exception in VAWA for bigamous marriages, but the officer refused to issue the visa because he said that the marriage was bigamous and therefore she didn't qualify even though you know she had been abused and she was pregnant and all this sort of thing. So he denied the visa and sent the case back for revocation. It went back to USCIS. They looked at it. They said there's an exception for bigamous. Um, 
um, relationships, so we're going to send this back to the State Department again. They should approve the visa for her. This resulted in what we call ping pong in the immigration world, where the application keeps going back between Homeland Security and the State Department, and the woman could never get her visa. So she applied for a refugee status and came to the United States as a refugee, because even though she couldn't get in with her SIV, because they couldn't process that, and they wouldn't process her VAWA application, she ended up being qualified for the refugee program. So she finally showed up in the United States, having been given one of the number, small number of um, refugee slots that was available. And then as soon as she got to the United States as a refugee, she was actually eligible to adjust her status under VAWA because the State Department was no longer involved in the decision to deny the VAWA application. And so she was able to you know, do this one-step adjustment application because USCIS had already approved the VAWA. I just throw that out as an example of the crazy you know, stuff that goes on out there. And this is somebody who ended up being admitted as a refugee who had another avenue available to her that was perfectly legitimate, but because nobody could work the system, she ended up coming in under the refugee quota. You know, so that's just one example, and I've got some other ones, but... Mark, yeah. Yeah, hi. Mark, no, uh, Don hey, mentioned. how are you? Um, uh, good. Uh, as Don mentioned, I'm working on a paper as part of this right. uh, on detention due process. Uh, a comment and a question. Um, I guess the comment is that as you're sketching out this system of, um, you know, territorial functional deterrence to applying to asylum, whether internal or external, what strikes me is that the deterrent penalties get strongest the closest that someone gets to the territory, to the border. Um, and I wonder if there's something symbolic about that. Uh, for example, you know, I mean, and it, it sort of goes from if you approach an embassy overseas, you're politely turned away. If you're trying to get on a plane, you might be turned away to, you know, you might be interdicted at sea, held temporarily and returned to when you actually approach a border and are presenting yourself, you are literally detained and locked up. And I wonder if there's something symbolic about that, um, to the sense that, you know, if we think of this as terms of a border, the border gets strongest the closest you are to it. The more the presumption becomes that you are a threat, an actual threat in your person, rather than a distant, more attenuated threat. Uh, and the second question I have also is, um, you know, the, um, uh, I guess if you, you know, if some of the proposals you're thinking about are to relax this territoriality, um, and whether there's examples um, out there of countries that have done that. Are there examples of countries that actually do allow people to apply for asylum at foreign consulates? You know, how has it worked? What are the pros and cons against that? Or, you know, that have taken a different approach? Or is it really just, uh, is it something that's more just inherent to a nation state that the, the default approach is not to look at that? So kind of a two-part question. It's probably our last question because we know we have to, we have to close up here soon, but on territorial access, the question is, to, you know, this, or the observation is that the deterrence seems to get stronger the closer you actually get to a border. Is it, is it true, and do, and do you have a response to that? And also, um, are, there other, are there examples of um, state practices where they allow for asylum to be sought within the, you know, the country where the person is at risk, I guess? And, and the answer is there have been those kinds of programs in the U.S. too, but anyway, let me do it. Well, on the second one, I think the movie Casablanca tells you that they have had those in the past. Yeah. Um, it, the, the function of the modern system, I think, is because of the visa system we've set up, not because you couldn't have a system like that, and we had it in the past where you could go to an embassy and get permission to go to the country. And, you know, and we, I guess we do have, today we have humanitarian parole. So, and that's been used. Sorry, I was supposed to tell me to shut up. <laughs> we've had, it, we've had uh, in country refugee screening, too. Yeah, we've also had, that's correct, we've had in country refugee screening, but um, I think you're thinking of something more like the old past system of you could go into a consulate and talk to a consular officer, and they would say, okay, you have a legitimate claim. Here's some papers of safe passage. You know, so now you can get on the Lisbon plane or whatever, and you can go on your way because you've been pre-approved overseas. Um, certainly, that's worth exploring. You know, that makes sense. On the um, 
the deterrence getting stricter. I don't know if it's symbolic. It's it's reality. The closer you are to me, the more of a threat you are, right? And if you're here, we have to take care of you. We have to feed you. We have to house you. We have to do more physical things. I'm not sure it's purely symbolic. I think there's probably also a physical component to it as well. We worry more if somebody's actually here in the United States than if they're thousands of miles away. And so it makes sense to have more deterrence the closer you get. Okay, just one more quick question. Yeah. The quick question is this. Um, it's regarding non-governmental organizations. Uh, we uh, obviously deal with this issue both on the ground with regard to helping people in detention, for example, not just in the United States, but also in the United States, uh, and also in terms of advocacy statements, uh, workshops at the uh, NGO consultations for UNHCR and so forth. My uh, question to you is simply whether there is something that in this vast array of incredible problems you've mentioned, there is something where you think NGOs either missed an opportunity or would have an opportunity, you know, to, to really grapple with something or touch something that perhaps we missed or that really needs help. So, that, so this is Eva Sandis. She's from the NGO Committee on Migration at the UN. She chairs it. Is that right? Chairs or directs it. And so the question is, it's kind of what NGOs can do and what opportunities we've, we've missed in terms of um, um, facilitating, promoting protection. Well, I think NGOs have been fundamentally involved in all of these issues, at least from what I've seen. And they play an integral role and extremely vital role. Governments simply can't handle all these issues on their own and just don't have the resources. In terms of missing an opportunity, I can't think of one off the top of my head, so I'll have to I'll punt on that one. Um, are there places in the future? Absolutely. In fact, I think uh, NGOs could play a key role in discussing this idea of territorial access and trying to figure out ways to alleviate it. The suggestion Mark had, you know, um, the suggestions other folks have raised about possibly um, splitting up responsibility, you know, NGOs would be playing a key role in advocating for that, either within their own country or internationally. So certainly there's a role. Okay, well, thank you very much, Margaret, and we should give Margaret a round of applause for being here. And for and thank you all for coming. Thank you for having us. <laughs>